and Savior Jesus Christ, who loved you with his very life. Amen. There was this, uh, this movie that came out uh, way back in the early 90s that's still pretty popular some 30 years later. Uh, they like to keep making sequels to it. And that movie is, of course, Jurassic Park. And I assume that the majority of you have, have seen Jurassic Park or, or one of its, its uh, sequels or whatever it is. But for the very least, you are somewhat familiar with the idea of Jurassic Park. If you're not, the premise of the movie is that, is that science is, has become so advanced in technology and in cloning that these scientists are able to actually clone dinosaurs, like, like actual dinosaurs, and, and bring them back from extinction. So they build this, this giant zoo uh, for dinosaurs, and it's called, called Jurassic Park. The park's filled with amazing critters, from the smallest of dinos to the largest, from all of the old favorites of when I was a six-year-old boy, like Triceratops, even the villains, like the T-Rex and the raptors and such. One of the, the driving principles of this movie or series of movies or the books that it's based off of is this idea of, of chaos. Um, if, you, if you can imagine a dinosaur wandering around the modern world it would cause some amount of chaos, and in the movies there is, in fact, lots and lots of chaos. See, our, our, this, our culture loves to explore this idea of chaos not just with dinosaurs, although it has been successful as this series has been going on for like 30 years now. But, but many of our, of our stories in the culture are, are works of fiction, whether it's in movies and TV or books, or even, even the internet, explores the theme of what if there was chaos everywhere. You know, in the movie Batman, there's the famous line, some people just like to watch the world burn. There's other movies like natural disaster movies, which explore the chaos of if the world goes bad. Space Invader movies explore the chaos of an alien invading the Earth. War movies explore the chaos of war. Apocalyptic movies, even, even comedies like what happens when a family adopts a dog and it grows much bigger than they expected. Lots of our stories center on the idea of chaos entering the lives of just regular people. Chaos has been around for a very, a very long time. And in fact, chaos is a huge, important theme throughout all of Scripture. The Bible spends a lot of time talking about how God brings order to a place of chaos. Just a few quick examples. Jesus calming the storm over the Sea of Galilee, God is bringing order to chaos. In fact, most of Jesus' miracles, God brings order to somebody's life who has been disrupted by some kind of chaos, whether it's healing miracles or feeding miracles, whatever. When Jonah goes to Nineveh, God brings order to a chaotic city. And then here, in Genesis, we see one of the clearest, the clearest examples of this theme that God is bringing order to chaos. We have before us this morning a text from Genesis chapter 3, most of chapter 3, uh, which is called the fall into sin. But we cannot look at Genesis 3 without first looking at Genesis chapters 1 and 2. It's all one big package. It would have been a lot to read this morning, so we're just going to kind of quickly talk about it. Genesis 1 and 2 give us the account of creation, of God speaking everything into existence over the course of six days. And the theme that, that frames these two chapters, chapters 1 and 2, the theme is, is God bringing order into a place of chaos. The first thing that God does is God brings order to light itself. It separates light from darkness. The light he calls day, the darkness he calls night. Could you imagine what it was before that moment? The chaos where light and dark are mingled together with no separation. I can't imagine what that would look like. I can't imagine a world without boundaries between light and dark. Because God brings order to chaos. And then God brings order to the planet, which was formless. The words of Hebrew are formless and void, this big chaotic mess. God separates the waters, he brings the sky into existence, he raises land out of the sea, makes boundaries, puts everything in its place. God brings order to chaos. The next three days of creation, days four, five, and six, God brings more order. Day four, God creates the sun and stars, which brings order to day one, where he created light. Day two, God creates birds and fish, which brings order, I'm sorry, day five, I mean, which brings order to day two, when he made the heavens and the seas. 
uh, day six then, God makes land animals for the ground which he made on day three. God brings order into a chaotic creation. And then at the end of it, he says, this is good. This is, this is very good to have brought such order. In chapter two then, we learn more about this, about God bringing order to creation. And we see God going out and playing in the dirt. Uh, like, like a potter playing with a vessel. God, God sculpts this man, forms him out of the dust of the ground. God takes the chaotic dirt and makes the order of a human person. He calls him Adam, which is just the Hebrew word for dirt, uh, because God made him from the man. And then he, he brings the animals by in order to see what the man's going to call him, and then he makes, he makes a, a suitable, suitable helper. Makes, makes a woman, bringing order into the life of man, to keep the man from his own chaos. And then God takes a step back, he looks over everything he made, and he says, this is, this is very good. And God stops creating. God gives a command to the, the pinnacle of his creation to this man and this woman, and he says, go and subdue creation. That's what the command is, go and bring order into this chaos. Tame the wilderness, and people have been doing that ever since. And we go out as a human race all the time, and we explore new places, and we bring them under our control into order. Even, even I was thinking about this, even the national park system, which is a controlled place <coughs> of wilderness, it's an order there. But then, after all of this ordering to chaos, we get to our text for this morning, Genesis chapter 3. And this is one of the hardest hitting chapters of the Bible. It records humanity's fall into sin. And guess how Moses chooses to write it out? That's right, it's a, it's a return to chaos. We see the man and the woman both reject God's order and embrace their own chaos and the chaotic lie from that old ancient serpent. So allow me to tell again the familiar story. They there in the Garden of Eden, the man and the woman together. They were given just a couple of rules, namely, go and eat from the trees. Uh, they're, they're food for you, there's fruit. But don't eat from that one tree over there, that's the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, because eating it will kill you. Don't eat that one. God warns them there and square. So there they are in the garden, they're doing the work God made for them to do, bringing about, bringing about order, and they're somewhere near that forbidden tree, and some thing, someone else is there, Deceiver, the ancient dragon, the serpent, the devil himself. The deceiver comes, and he comes to the woman, and he entices her with the thing that is forbidden. Um, the serpent tells her, "They oh, you're missing out. God's, God's actually holding out on you. If you eat of that tree, you're going to be like God. You're going to be more than you are right now. You're going to be who God is. God's order is wrong. There's a better way, says the serpent. And that tree, it, uh, it, looks, it looks so good. That fruit looks delicious. And she's hungry, she sees it, she, she reaches out, takes it, and she eats. And then she gives some to her husband, Adam, who's right next to her the whole time, just as silent as he can be, listening to what the serpent says. And he takes it and he eats it. And as a side note, uh, later on in scripture, it calls this the sin of Adam, not Eve. Uh, that's a topic for today. But what happens next is. Chaos is back. It's like somebody took and dropped a ravenous T-Rex in downtown San Francisco, and it's on the rampage. The man and the woman, they look different. Something's different. They don't like that. They don't, they don't look like they used to. They see themselves, they see one another, and they're ashamed. They feel bad, guilty, embarrassed. They know what evil is now, because they have become evil. And chaos, chaos which God worked so hard to destroy, has entered into his garden sanctuary. And so the man and woman, they go and they hide. First, they hide themselves from each other. They sew together these, these clothes up, these leaves. And then they hide themselves from God. I always, I always picture it as like hiding behind a bush when you're playing hide and seek for the tall grass or something like that. Because they're afraid. They're ashamed. Chaos is now their life. And what happens in the next few chapters, through chapter 11, are just more and more examples of chaos re-entering the world. With Cain and Abel in the next chapter, chaos. With Eve, 
the evil of humanity which leads to the flood, polygamy, false god worship, murder and other sins. It's just more and more chaos. After the flood, we see the chaos of the Tower of Babel, where humans want to become God. More chaos. Chaos is bad. And we still experience chaos today. And like it or not, we contribute to it. I mean, willingly at times, unknowingly at others, but it's there. Even this morning, I am I'm confident that many of you had a chaotic time getting out of the house to get to church on time this morning. We don't have the tree of good and evil anymore, and we don't need its help showing us what is evil, because we know evil all too well because it's born inside of us, and evil is our, our fundamental nature. And so often, we like chaos. We're just like Adam and Eve, and we, we look with our eyes at something that's forbidden, now, whether it's a lie that we tell to either get ahead or save our, sin, our skins from punishment, or it's a, it's a new toy that somebody else has, or maybe maybe our eyes see someone offending us and we get angry at them. Or perhaps it's another person who's not our spouse. Our eyes, our eyes see something and for a moment it looks good, it looks pleasing, and we want it. We want to protect ourselves, we want to make ourselves better at someone else's expense. We deserve what somebody else has. So we reach out. We take, we take a big bite, willingly, knowingly, bringing chaos to ourselves. We bring sin to ourselves all the time. And in the words of God this morning, in the day you eat it, you will surely die. So it is no surprise that we see death inside of us and death all around us. So what can we do? Well, we can't do anything. Chaos is not something that we have the power of ourselves to escape. But we do have a God who likes to bring order to a place of chaos. Even here, in Genesis 3, God promises once again that he's going to fight chaos. To send someone to crush the head of the snake that brought it. God promised a savior, someone who can do what he and as you read through the scriptures, you have to wait a long time to learn who this Savior is, this, this Messiah, this Christ. And we are blessed to know who it is, that it's, it's Jesus. Jesus is the one who fights chaos. We see it in our gospel lesson this morning. Jesus is there in the place of chaos, the wilderness itself. He's hungry, a chaotic state, and he's talking to that author of chaos himself, that ancient snake. And what does Jesus do? He brings order. He sets things straight. Man doesn't live on bread alone. Don't put God to the test. Get away from me, Satan. Jesus bringing order to chaos. And he brings order to your life as well. Jesus works to straighten you out and put things back into place. And this starts with the second tree of life in the Bible, which for you, for me, for us, is the cross. The cross is the new tree of life. It is the tree place where we receive the life that overcomes the death of chaos. The cross is where Jesus takes the sin from our lives and he kills it. It dies with him on that tree, and now that cross is a new tree of life. It's not life for Jesus, he dies there, but life for you, because Jesus died there in your place. And in the day of Jesus' doing, you will surely live. Now your sins are forgiven, and you have been given life. So each day, each and every single day, we fight chaos. We may not have T-Rex and Velociraptors stopping us with the grasses, but we do fight against sin. Every day we're fighting this. But praise be to God, the Christ Jesus, who fights chaos in our place has brought order to our lives, who has given us forgiveness, life, and salvation. Because that's what this <coughs> is. This is our God who brings order to chaos, who brings forgiveness for, forgiveness for sinners, and life to those who are dead. So let us look to the tree of life. Let us look to the cross and see the one who offers his life in our place, that we might be his. Now may the peace of God that passes all understanding guard your hearts and your minds forever in Christ Jesus. Amen.